Biobalance HealthCast, episode 220, Triglycerides and the Type 2 Diabetes Epidemic. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. I'm sure that most of you know that there is an epidemic of diabetes type 2 that's burgeoning across this continent. And so Sadly. many people in middle age and as they age become afflicted by diabetes type 2. And so today, Kathy and I are going to talk about, Dr. Moppin and I are going to talk about diabetes type 2 and triglycerides and how the sugar systems work to provide energy for your body, which is it, your body converts the food that you eat into a form of sugar that goes to the cells that is the gasoline that makes them run. And so we have to have it, but it's complicated. And diagnosing and treating these illnesses is complicated, especially when you begin to say, why is this epidemic here and how can we avoid it? I think it's even harder for the layperson to sort out why doctors are doing the tests they're doing. Right. And why is it that when we talk about blood lipids, we've done, been talking about that. When we talk about blood lipids, we say cholesterol's high, HDL's low. Those are that's bad. HDL's a good one. Yeah. So cholesterol's high. LDL is one of the bad cholesterols. Right. But you need all these cholesterols for your body. You just don't need too much. And the reason they're bad is because they can form plaque on the blood vessels. So the real key to this is diabetes sets you up for oftentimes a higher cholesterol level and inflammation because you gain weight and these high triglycerides. Now triglycerides aren't cholesterol, okay? Triglycerides are in that lipid test, right? but triglycerides are really directly from sugar that you eat. Okay. Or sugar that run, that is circulating in your system. So your doctor says your lipids are fine, but your triglycerides are high. So so when they start to read about triglycerides, they will start to read about <laughs> glycemic index mm -hmm. and uh, glycemic counts on different things because there's it's more than just white refined sugar. It's more than just the sugar in a candy mm -hmm. bar or the sugar in ice cream Flour. that's been added. Anything that has flour in it, anything that has corn in it, mm -hmm. anything that corn has syrup. processed, yeah, corn syrup, yeah. sodas, if we could get, I mean, really. Corn syrup's in almost everything. Yeah, and it's really in sugar Which was soda. a political decision made by the people that were supporting the corn farmers. Yes, but now it's a political decision to block it now that we're, and so there's so a, many people. A new group, the watermelon farmers are coming up. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well, okay, so let me, let me back up. People, the doctor says your lipids are fine. Or your lipids aren't fine. Hmm. There's two components. One is cholesterol. One's triglycerides. They're treated differently. Okay. Okay. As I found out recently from my cardiologist, they finally figured out that all are affected by sugar, by carbs in your diet. So both cholesterol and triglycerides are controlled by that, but they're treated with different medication. So if you have really high cholesterol, but your triglycerides are fine, then they can put you they put you on a statin okay that lowers your cholesterol doesn't touch your triglycerides so if you it's like a chemistry set yeah add a little of this don't that's touch. right but if you have high triglycerides then your doctor puts you on on a fibrate or phenofibrate is the drug mm -hmm. and that drops the triglycerides okay if you have both they may put you on both a statin and a fi fibr what is phenofibrate phenofibrate so, but generally, so, so all of these things are associated with heart disease, but when you look at triglycerides by themselves, they have not been tied to heart attack, even though they put them in this panel, even though it counts towards your risk factor, mm -hmm. they have not found the triglycerides themselves cause heart attack. My, the way I look at this is, I look at it as two pieces of a puzzle. If the cholesterol is high, I want to make sure that patients eating properly, exercising, and their thyroid's normal, because a low thyroid can cause a high cholesterol. Then I look at the triglycerides. If that's elevated, then I look at diet, exercise, you know, like too many carbs, too much sedentary activity or non-activity. And then I also look for diabetes, okay? so. 
those are the ways I pull this apart and the way you should think about it as two separate issues. Now you can still have high cholesterol and have diabetes. And you can still have diabetes and have low triglycerides. But th these are things that when I'm just looking at this and don't know a patient, these are things that I pull in and talk to the patient about and say, well, what's your activity level? What do you eat? That kind of thing. And so, try to help them normalize. So this is news to me because years ago, <clears throat> my regular physician looked at me and said, your triglycerides are above X. You are now diabetic. And... I said, oh, I, I thought this range was pre-diabetic. And she said, there's no such thing as pre-diabetic. You're either diabetic or you're not. And this number point is the point at which we divide it. So you're diabetic. And so then I started getting mail from insurance companies and she, sample diets and whatever. Because she coded you as a diabetic. Yes, yeah, she did. And that <laughs> helped me a lot in terms of filling my mailbox. Um, you, in talking about it with me as we were preparing this, were using the term pre-diabetes. So and is that new information or are doctors just learning better how to communicate where they are? Or ten, tell me. Ten years ago. It was at least that. Ten years ago, we were taught that you're either diabetic or you're not diabetic. In fact, I never believed that because it's always on a continuum. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, on, it's, it's your blood sugar goes up, starts going up. This is type 2 diabetes we're talking about, not juvenile, not not children that get a virus and then get diabetes. Mm -hmm. This is this is fat diabetes, okay? Right. So you get fatter and fatter because you get more and more insulin resistant. It's a positive feedback system. So basically, you gain weight, then your triglycerides go up and your blood sugar goes up because you're not just diabetic because your triglycerides are up. It's because your blood sugar and your triglycerides are up. Right. So, so that it's it's this positive feedback system. It keeps going, and you keep getting worse and worse, until somehow you stop it. And it's very hard to lose weight when you're in this condition. Mm -hmm. Because it's not an excuse. It's just that it's very hard because your body is continually more resistant and continually increasing blood sugar and triglycerides. So it's a never-ending problem. Because of what you said earlier in the podcast that that your cells become resistant to insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then all of the sugar in your system, whether it's healthy or unhealthy sugar, mm -hmm. converts to fat. Right. Which makes you hungrier and makes you need more sugar. And so you and eat makes more you more resistant to makes sugar. you more resistant. To so you have insulin. Insulin resistant, pre diabetes and diabetes. They're mm -hmm. like escalated phases of the same condition. Right. And I've always viewed it that way from the very beginning of medical school where I took care of insulin dependent diabetics. Right. Uh, at camp, like for kids, right. I learned a lot about that. And then when I became an OBGYN and I had to deal with type 2 diabetes in pregnancy, yeah. because that, you know, you get type 2 diabetes in pregnancy, that means that you have the genetics and the metabolism to get type 2 diabetes later in life. So we dealt with it with diet and exercise and sometimes medication in pregnancy. But then I also took care of people who were past pregnancy and then getting the type 2 diabetes. So I knew it was a continuum. I watched them over years. You could tell it. But the medicine gurus that write out guidelines never accepted that. Right. They just said, you got it or you don't have it. So I would t take people doing what I was supposed to do, refer patients that I thought were diabetes or almost diabetic to an endocrinologist and that's when I kind of got a bad taste in my mouth about endocrinologists because mm -hmm. they'd send them back and say to the patient, she doesn't know what she's talking about. You don't have diabetes yet. Come back when you do. Mm -hmm. So then I had to learn. So then I gathered all the information I could gather from their own journals. Right. About, which you still read. Which I still read. about In self-defense. <laughs> yeah, about diabetes and pre-diabetes. And I then treated them myself. Mm -hmm. which was with metformin and with diet and with exercise, people got better. I told them it was like pulling them back away from that cliff of diabetes. I'm like, I've got the rope, and I'm yanking them back away from the edge because once you're over the edge, for those people who don't want to eat a low-carb diet, you're definitely going to have to eat a low-carb diet. If you get diabetes, then you're stuck with that the rest of your life. So you might as well do it, do it now and get the most out of it and not get type 2 diabetes, so but wanna, you need some help. You I want to ask you an off-the-wall question about okay. diets, and if it's not relevant to this conversation, I'm not sure if it is. If it's not, tell me, and we'll have okay. it another time. I, I was talking to somebody the other day that was proud of the fact that they're going on a paleo diet, 
And I said, what does that mean? And she said, to, to me it means you don't eat anything that wasn't available to the caveman to eat. So nothing that's processed, nothing mm -hmm. that's evolved or made mm -hmm. artificially. And I said, well, nuts and berries, you could gather that. You can have, you know, well, yeah. I, I know what this so diet is. So I was talking is. about honey and gathering level, yeah. paleo, mm -hmm. or, you know, like wild grains, or what are you talking about? Yeah, because whole grain. Once they began to wild uh, domesticate agricultural products, mm -hmm. they started to change. Mm -hmm. So where do you draw the line? They, I mean, they how's that different the, from the paleo a low diet? Well, the paleo diet doesn't allow milk, which I think is weird because, of course, there had to be milk of some animal at some point right um but so it's not exactly just what the caveman could have because they may not have domesticated animals but there were animals that were making milk well there were and, and, and so certainly nomadic have, tribes made uh in the the uh, mongols made uh, alcoholic drinks out of milk fermented milk right and they drank the blood from the animals directly and they drank the milk they used it in different substances you know, mm. but but that's not what the the person that devised this paleo diet had in mind. And and basically, what they did was they worked backwards. They gave a great name to low carb, low lactose diet. They just basically no milk, for whatever reason, and partially because milk can be inflammatory, and in some people cause you to gain weight. Some other people it doesn't. But um, we had a paleo Thanksgiving at my daughter's house. Oh, interesting. And that was tough. Did you all bring your clubs? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no. I mean, it was. It's the diet they were following, and it was yeah. what what they should be following. But instead of having potatoes, we had wild rice because wild rice you can gather, and wild rice is a seed and not a not a um, it's not a grain. Mm. It's not like rice. It's wild rice, which means it's a seed. So we had that. So that was acceptable. It didn't basically. It doesn't stimulate your insulin. That's what we're looking for in a paleo diet. It's another way of saying you can eat all the protein you want and all the fresh vegetables and all the fresh fruit that you could gather. But you can't do eggs. You can't do milk. You can't do butter. Right. So what do you flavor your food with? We actually did use butter. Hmm. You know, but partially because I, I'm like, well, this is just a low carb diet, so let's eat butter. Yeah. You know, right. but no margarine because right. that's from a grain. So, so basically, that is a low carb diet. Okay. And and when we're looking at this, interestingly enough, ten years ago, when the cardiologists cardiologists looked at this diet and went, no, too much animal food, too much meat, too much cheese. And my cardiologist looks at me, and, or not too much cheese, but too much meat, too much meat, basically, too much fat. My cardiologist said, it's all about carbs. It's always been about carbs. He said, they just figured out at the top of the level of cardiology that it's about carbs. And now they're trying to change everything all the way down. So all those years you didn't eat eggs, God forbid. You should have been eating eggs. Yeah. Not those pale yellow eggs, but farm eggs. Those are, those are worth it. You know, but... You should be eating eggs. So they took them away from us. And if you're a lot of the eat advice cheese, you, you get should is eat hard cheese, not soft cheese. Right. You shouldn't eat processed cheese. Right. All of these things in the paleo diet that we've just discussed are actually really good for di diabetics and are really good for people who are trying trying to decrease their cholesterol. Part of the problem with how we view what we eat is that we think that what we eat goes into our stomach. And it comes out of our out of our stomach the same way it went in, that it goes in as a protein, and it comes out as a protein. It goes in as a sugar, comes out as a sugar because basically, we make fat, which is triglycerides, out of sugar. Never really thought about it that way. We and not out of protein. Well, no, not out of protein. It's out of yeah. sugar. Okay. So if you eat a lot of sugar and a lot of carbohydrate, you're going to make a lot of triglycerides. Right. Okay. So then you're going to make more fat. Right, so you're going to make more fat. But when we eat fat, it doesn't necessarily go to triglycerides. Right, eating fat per se, like in uh, a, a marbleized steak that yeah. has fat in it. Right, isn't going to make that your avoid triglycerides that because it's go got up? Fat. Yeah. Right. So, okay. so fat that we eat isn't necessarily fat in our blood. Sugar. It, it that absolutely we eat, is not. Actually. That's right. Yeah. But sugar that we eat is absolutely fat in our blood. So you have to change how you view food if you're going to look at your triglycerides and your cholesterol, and then. Because basically that's what this is all about. The diabetic, the diabetic issue has to do with the triglycerides, really. And 
diabetes, diabetics have a lot of sugar in their blood, so they make a lot of triglycerides, so they make a lot so of fat. So if you're eating a lot of cakes and pies and ice cream Cookies, and things like that, crackers. you might as well just be rubbing them directly on your thighs and hips. That's right. I mean, that's where they're going. And you don't have to worry about fat actually like butter. Fat actually makes you feel full, and carbs make you hungry. So the more you eat carbs, and God forbid, wine while you're cooking dinner is the stupidest thing anybody trying to lose weight can do. You if mean drinking it? Drinking, or, or you mean adding? not whining, wine. Wine, drinking while you're making dinner. You want me to say something different so you can still do that. But, um, but that's the stupidest thing you can do because it makes you hungry. It goes directly to triglycerides. It d goes directly to sugar, and it goes directly to fat. If you don't go out and run after dinner, you're sunk. So use your calories appropriately. But let's let's look at triglycerides in a way. There's there's something really interesting about familial high triglycerides. Let's let's go there. Okay. Because there's two types of familial high triglycerides, and the way you divide them is by doing a an additional test by just rather than just saying, oh, you have high triglycerides. Uh, stop eating sugars and take this drug. If you want to know if you're at risk for heart disease, the two familial um, types of hydroglycerides, one has a high rate of heart disease and one does not. Okay? okay. It's not just triglycerides that tell you, they really don't have an association all by themselves with heart disease, but the genetics right. behind one of the familial. Which called, is why you guys always ask the, your, your mom and dad have diabetes right. or heart Fam issues. Family history is okay. very important, and family history of a heart attack. Or a stroke before 50 is important right? because usually that means some familial abnormality in how you process your food. So the familial combined hyperlipidemia, meaning that you have high cholesterol and high triglycerides, that one does increase your risk of heart disease. Okay. And the way you tell is you have a high... Um, excuse me, a high ApoB, which is a, like a fragment of the one of the cholesterols, and a high LDL, okay? High ApoB, high LDL, that's bad. That's high and risk. standard blood test will tell them that? I mean, well, it breaks that out? Uh, they, you have to actually order a higher level of okay. lipids, but if All somebody right. has family, family history and a high LDL, then they should get the next step of the test, which is to look at the ApoB. Because if you don't have the ApoB with the high LDL, then you're less likely? To have a heart attack from, from your high lipids. Okay. So, so the other familial hypertriglyceride is, is just high triglycerides. It shows a high VLDL. That's one of the standard tests. VLDL is one of the supposedly dangerous um, cholesterols. You have a normal LDL, okay, and these people have a low HDL, which is usually considered dangerous. So the way we divide these up, the people with the high VLDL, normal LDL, low HDL, they're fine. They don't have a high risk of heart disease. So there are markers that tell people. And also to tell them if they're they genetically the at risk. And right. the doctors should and run the doctors these. should then look at those and tell you, you have a more serious degree of risk, so you have to take this more seriously. Take a medication. About, yes. Change your diet. Exercise, because if you have the first one, the familial combined to hyperlipidemia, then you're at risk for an early heart attack. So you need to do something about and, that. And there are some medicines now, just within the last six months or a year, mm -hmm. that have been approved for diet medicines, things like metformin for right. pre-diabetes. And losing weight is something that, that really benefits. helps this. So right. not only could you take, if you're in the high risk group, could you take something like phenofibrate that decreases your triglycerides, right. but you could also exercise, eat properly, meaning low, low, carbs, low carbs, and you could look at the diet, if you have diabetic tendencies, such as a high um, hemoglobin A1C or a high blood sugar fasting, then you could take metformin. And that would help you lose weight. Or a new drug called Victoza, which will help you lose weight as well. And thereby help you avoid type 2 diabetes and heart attack. Right. And that in itself will decrease your triglycerides. So, so get in ahead of it. Right. So we're not only talking about managing your lipids by 
lifestyle and exercise right. and a drug. We're also talking about managing the diabetes that is possibly yet to come. I mean, you're pre-diabetic, but avoiding that, pulling yourself away from the cliff of diabetes and saving yourself all of the diseases that go along with diabetes. So this it's a very important question. And if your doctor says you have high triglycerides, you need to say, okay, well, I'll do this Usually they'll put you on diet and exercise. I'll right. do this for three, three to six months. Right. Then I want to come back and have a more spe spe specialized test right. and see where I am on and see factors. if I'm still at risk or if I need something else. Because oftentimes they'll just see C in next year. Well, in the and you need to know whether it really worked or not. And if you still need to have more testing. And most people have a history of going on a diet to lose 10 pounds for an occasion. You know, like it's uh, a wedding. It's my daughter's wedding. I have to fit in this dress. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then when the occasion is over, they put that weight right back on and, and usually add a pound or two. Because yeah. they've deprived themselves. Instead so of changing their perspective on what and how they eat, they deprive themselves for a while, a limited period of time, to accomplish an immediate objective. And then when that has been done, they go back to what their mind has told them is normal for them. So you really do have to change your thinking about what you eat and how you eat and about exercise and how you exercise. You can't just do it for a set goal. When I reach the goal, then all bets are off. I go back to being what I was before. Mm -hmm. This will come right back. That's right. But it helps when you have help from your doctor by giving you a medication to help pre-diabetes, to decrease your insulin resistance, to... To, there's even niacin you can take for cholesterol, but there's there's help that's never been there before, and knowledge that's never been there. And before. the medications for weight loss, besides metformin and, and um, Victoza, there's a lot of other medications that we can now use. So, so in your practice, which works. is primarily hormone focused, you also have diet programs, exercise programs. You can help people who have these issues aside from whether always, or not. Yeah, they have I mean, hormone issues. This is, when somebody comes in for hormones, I look at these issues. This is part of my workup. Right. If you need a specialist, I'll send you to a specialist. If you need a diet, then I'll put you into with my nurse practitioners into the diet program to get diet medication and follow up on a regular basis so that you can be successful at losing weight and not getting diabetes. Or if you've started, if you have early diabetes, you you can stop having diabetes if you right. do the right things like you did essentially right. so seriously when you go to your physician listen to what they have to say about ldl and triglycerides uh, and follow their recommendations about diet and exercise but when you come back in three months or six months mm -hmm. if there still are concerns have these more advanced tests that can tell you if you're genetically predisposed because that increases your risk for heart attack and diabetes mm -hmm. uh, and know that there's help, and there are medicines, and there are support programs. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching it, but Christy Alley, who most mm -hmm. people know, mm -hmm. has lost another 50 pounds, and that's all in the news lately. Mm -hmm. And she did it following a protocol that she's followed before and mm -hmm. lost weight on. But then but afterwards, then she, she goes back. back and gains it back. So now she's saying, this time I've seen the light, I've taken the oath, the, you know. We I can only hope anymore. that she's right. Hopefully, but, but, that, but that's true for all of us, and it's issues mm -hmm. that we struggle with. But if you've been, but if you get down to a certain weight and you're there for a year, it's right. less likely that you're going to go back your, up. Your mental plateau sets, and your physiologic um, System level. Balances. See, the body, the body's brilliant. The body right. always wants to go back to where you were for the longest period of time. Right. So if you've been obese for a long time, it's really hard to get to a new set point yes, and stay there. And once you're there and you're there for a year, then it should be easier. That should be your new be set more point. Ingrained. Right. Unless psychologically you overwhelm it with, oh, I'm going to have a good time now, so I'm just going to eat anything I want. Or you overwhelm with issues you haven't dealt with, like abuse histories right. that, that you eat in order to bury the pain. I mean, That's there true. are balancing issues there, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not just mechanical. No. Uh, it's it psychological, not. too. So anyway, it's a complex pro problem, and hopefully this will give you some information to think about and maybe do some research on. Uh, live healthy. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy 
and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.